Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Underground. This is the briefing for Thursday, the 20th of January, 2022. Sorry, it's been a while since our last brief. We have been super busy trying to work on a lot of communication stuff, a lot of educational stuff that's going to be coming out uh, sometime soon. And, of course, uh, the past at least two to three weeks have been uh, filled with preparation for the Ukrainian war, which is looking more imminent with every passing moment. As a result, we're going to keep this brief light today, and we're going to go ahead and skip past the stuff I normally talk about and just start with logistics. So uh, I really don't have that many specific logistics, but uh, if, if any of you have been to the grocery store over the past week or so, you know that uh, this is a common trend these days. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't know if this is a genuine shortage or if it's one of those manufactured shortages where... A journalist writes a newspaper article or something on Twitter and it starts trending and sooner or later everyone's out of everything. Uh, but it's most certainly uh, a very tangible thing that a lot of places are having shortages right now. We're talking shortages of pretty much everything you could possibly imagine. Uh, consumer goods, meats, fresh, uh, fresh food products. Uh, all kinds of stuff and some of this in different areas can be attributed to staffing shortages. Uh, other parts of it, uh, other areas of the country, it's really hard to tell uh, what the logistical challenges are. Uh, but just know that there are a lot of shortages. I, I simply cannot name them all. Uh, you'll see a lot of things on, on Twitter like the, the hashtag uh, Bear Shelves Biden is trending on Twitter. But unfortunately, again, these kinds of pictures don't really give us that much information. They tell us a, a snapshot in time that, a, that one specific area, uh, if someone even tells where the picture's from, it only gives us a snapshot and we don't really get a good idea of what's going on. So somebody could take a picture like this and circulate it around social media and then you have to deal with Man, pictures of, of things like the uh, earlier shortages, people saying, oh, look at, you know, look at my local grocery store, and it turns out it's a picture from like three years ago. It's really hard to tell this stuff. Um, so, yeah, I hate, I hate to just kind of leave everybody hanging on the logistics front that, oh, yeah, there's shortages of, of what? Well, everything. Um, yeah, so something to keep in mind as we start getting a lot of the winter weather for a lot of parts of the country you know that that normally brings about shortages and especially in areas like like where we're at where we don't normally get a lot of winter weather but uh, we get just a little bit you know and everybody goes kind of crazy so something to keep in mind is logistic uh, logistics is going to be a a problem for the foreseeable future at least uh, at least for the next couple of weeks um, and we can talk about that a little bit when we go to critical infrastructure so one of the bigger uh, items of critical infrastructure news coming out this week is the 5G uh, rollout scandal scenario. I don't really know what to call it. Uh, basically what's happening is a lot of uh, cell carriers are rolling out 5G in a lot of areas and foreign airlines are, are actually boycotting flights to the United States. So. As of, as of the past 24 hours, we've seen many, many, many foreign airlines uh, cancel flights to the United States uh, in response to the rollout of 5G in larger parts of the United States. So the reason for this is that, at least in Europe, they have found that the radar altimeters or the radio altimeters or, or different kinds of systems on board aircraft, both fixed wing and rotary wing, are being affected by 5G. They think. Nobody really has put out any concrete data on it that I've seen so far. Uh, it should be fairly simple. Uh, you know, what what bandwidth of the electromagnetic spectrum does 5G operate on? And, you know, what bandwidth do, you know, aircraft systems operate on? Well, you know, aircraft are different. So, in any case, what is the result of this is airlines are canceling flights. So, no American airline uh, company has done anything as far as I've seen. They're pushing back on it, but they haven't actually canceled flights. Um, so, yeah, this has just kind of spun way out of control over the past 24 hours or so, and it's become a really big deal really quickly, even though 5G has been out in a lot of areas in, in the United States for a very long time now. I mean, where we're at, we've had 5G for a, a very long time. There's like a, you know, a 5G tower like like less than half a mile from where I live and you know it's it's been there for at least a year and a half now I think so you know I, I don't really know what the effects of this are going to be on aviation long term but I can tell you it is causing a lot 
of uh, consternation within the aviation community, specifically when it comes to foreign, um, outside the United States, aviation assets trying to have flights to the United States. Uh, also, number two there, keeping in the theme of logistics, uh, or at least disruptions, there has been a rash of, or, or rather I should say, a lot of viral videos come out lately regarding Los Angeles rail theft. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen the videos. Um, if I can find a clip that I think I can get away with putting on YouTube, I'll put it up. But honestly, it's everywhere. It's on every social media app and platform nowadays. You've probably seen the, the pictures of uh, these uh, train uh, derailments. There was actually a train that was derailed that a lot of people are thinking is due to uh, people trying to derail the train to stop it to get the uh, consumer goods out of the shipping containers. So, yeah, this is something that's like normally I, I wouldn't touch because it doesn't have a whole lot of intel value and it's just, you know, it tends to be one of those really inflammatory social issues that doesn't really have a whole lot of bearing on things. Um, but it, it just goes to show you the power of looting. Like, you know, it, it, it's one thing to talk about, you know, so, you know, a, a lot of people, hundreds of people going in and looting like a consumer goods store, you know, like a... Uh, a luxury goods store, like a luxury clothing store or something like that, and just running out with stuff. Well, you know, that just kind of speaks to the crime in the country or the crime in a specific area. But now we're starting, like, when, when we're starting to see trains derailed so that people can steal Amazon packages, that's a big deal. Um, and I would, I would be very surprised if the larger uh, shipping uh, companies, specifically the rail companies themselves, uh, from an insurance standpoint, their insurance companies might force them to start using different tracks and different shipping hubs so uh, we'll see how this goes um this has been a problem in california specifically los angeles for a very long time uh, i haven't really seen this be an issue anywhere else in the united states uh there have been a lot of train derailments and uh, terrorist activity up in the pacific northwest i do know that that has gotten almost no press over the past couple of years but there have been quite a few incidences if you can search that on your own uh, but yeah, if we're starting to see trains derailed just so people can steal stuff, mm, yeah, th that's going to be a, a huge liability because trains are very expensive. And they, you know, just because they're carrying Amazon packages in, on one car, they might be carrying medication on the next car or petroleum on the next car or some kind of, you know, chemical substance, you know, somewhere on that train. So again, huge deal, uh, something to keep an eye on. And um, yeah, I guess we'll just have to watch and see what happens. Thirdly, again, something to, to keep in mind is cellular communication not being reliable. Now, this is, a again, a very huge deal. I feel like this is the brief of very huge deals uh, because usually when we, when we talk about things like censorship, we're talking about things like social media. And there's a reason for this because social media has found exceptions to telecommunications laws or different parts of U.S. code that they can use as justification for censoring things. For instance, a lot of um, social media apps claim that they act as a publisher, and a publisher can choose what content they host and what content they don't. Um, however, a lot of people are of the opinion that a lot of social media are uh, acting as public infrastructure, and that you know kind of changes the rule. Well, well, here's the thing. Well, stop talk, let's stop talking about social media for a second. Cellular communications, telecommunications providers, they are public utilities, and public utilities that is a big no-no to censor. Uh, we're talking going all the way back to like the Watergate stuff and wiretaps. That's how far back this legislation goes when it comes to specifically telecommunications providers either censoring or tapping or surveilling different kinds of communications so while the you know the social media stuff uh, social media censorship that's relatively new as of the past 10 years or so this uh, cellular cellular communication and telecom uh, agencies in general are very much uh, have very strict rules when it comes to this so when you've got uh, like T-Mobile is one of the bigger ones that says hey, we have the right to censor your text messages. Mm, well, no, you don't. There's a whole stack of U.S. You know, code that says you can't do that. Um, but they're continuing to do that. So, again, this is a, a much larger thing that is worth paying attention to because I, I really don't think a whole lot of people think about their text messages being 
you know, censored. Like we, we all kind of, this is 2022, right? We all kind of know that there's federal surveillance on pretty much every communications platform there is. Uh, but when it comes to a cellular company choosing to not let a link go through, mm, that's a big deal. And then, like I also mentioned, number four there, uh, wrapping up our critical infrastructure stuff. Uh, again, we're going to talk Ukraine in a specific series. Uh, we're going to launch another uh, series on that, uh, depending on how things go. But the short version of why the Ukrainian conflict matters for United States infrastructure is that un the United States uh, critical infrastructure, particularly when it comes to cyber uh, stuff, uh, that's a vulnerability. Uh, there are lots of vulnerabilities in the cyber realm, and Russia may seek to capitalize on those vulnerabilities as a way of weakening the United States even further and kind of using that as a way to you know, pump the brakes on U.S. Uh, interactions. Basically, Russia is very much uh, fond uh, lately, at least their senior military leadership is fond of giving warnings and things like that. So we might see, you know, a pipeline go offline. We might see an electrical grid go down. And, uh, and that might be Russia's way of saying, hey, stay out or else we're going to do worse. So we'll come back to that, I guess, when, when we talk about Ukraine a little bit later. But, um, yeah, lots of vulnerabilities for our critical infrastructure these days, and there's not really a whole lot we can do about it, I guess, except be prepared on an individual level. Moving on to significant governmental actions, one of the most uh, significant events that has occurred has been the Supreme Court overruling Biden's medical mandates when it comes to uh, private companies, 100 persons or more. I haven't read through the actual uh, verdict yet, and I haven't read the opinion uh, that the Supreme Court has put forward on it yet. Uh, but it looks like the uh, mandate for medical workers can stay and the mandate for everybody else has to kind of go away. Now, we're seeing a lot of things that are going to affect different communities very differently with this. And here's what I mean. Um, what the Supreme Court has said, and I have to look at the wording again to confirm, but from what I can tell... It seems like, of, of course this is all opinion anyway, uh, it seems like the Supreme Court says, hey, if you work in healthcare, you have to get the jab because of Medicare or Medicaid funding. If you work in an institution that gets that, you have to get the jab because of that. I'm not quite sure how solid that logic is, but it's, I mean, I, I think that's what they're trying to say. Again, there's an entire field of law dedicated to just, just kind of interpreting what the Supreme Court says because they never really do anything specific. They always do broad brush, broad brush stuff, and lower courts have to interpret Supreme Court rulings. So I have no doubt that this will occur. Um, specifically because a lot of healthcare workers are very upset about this, um, as one might imagine, because essentially the Supreme Court is saying, in a de facto way, is that de depending on your job, you have no rights to what, to what you want to put in your own body. If you work in a certain job, you don't have that right to choose. And that's kind of a dangerous precedent. Now, again, how other courts interpret this, I don't know. I don't have the bandwidth to kind of figure this stuff out. I'm definitely no no expert on the law or, or even a novice in the law. I'm, com I'm a complete neophyte when it comes to this kind of stuff. But I can tell you that this is going to cause a lot of uh, problems within the healthcare community because hospitals are going to crack down on this and healthcare workers are going to have very little uh, leg to stand on. So when it comes to an intel perspective, this means that we're going to start seeing certain hospitals in certain areas usually probably major cities are going to have a lot of healthcare workers just leave and say it's not worth fighting this fight anymore. Um, so you're going to have a lot of service interruptions as a result of this. Now, on the other side of that, when it comes to the private, uh, private company stuff, we're starting to see a lot of companies, uh, specifically uh, companies that are sort of in the, the, the federal sphere, like defense contractors and things like that, saying, okay, the Supreme Court says that the federal government doesn't have to mandate it, but they didn't say anything about us mandating it, so we're going to mandate it still as a company. And, you know, there you go. It's like, well, what do you, you know, what do you do? What do you do about that? And then again, also, we have press releases from, from the White House saying, yeah, don't worry about the Supreme Court's ruling. We'll just go ahead with the mandates. Like, I don't know. I really don't know what to think about the rule of law these days. I don't know if, if any of it, any shred of it exists left anymore. So 
Either way, uh, something also along the the uh, avenues of the White House is the concrete wall that the White House has put up. So, again, not really a whole lot of intel value here other than this just kind of happened. So, it's just like, like a news note. Um, but I do think that when it comes to uh, w- what the interpretations of why they would have put the wall up, uh, yeah, why, why would the White House put a concrete wall up? Well, it's because they're scared. So they think there's a vulnerability there, and they want to patch that vulnerability. Why did the vulnerability, did the vulnerability, was it always there, or was it, is it a new vulnerability? I don't know. There's a lot of protests coming up uh, in at the uh, end of the month here, so maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. I'm more inclined to think that it's just the increasing of the military-industrial complex uh, and the fortification of our public infrastructure when it comes to you know the political elites. That's what I really think it is. Moving on, uh, kind of moving back to the jab stuff, uh, we're starting to see an interesting trend come out of California, and as we all know, if it happens in California and it's kind of totalitarian sounding, it's going to make its way to other places too. Is It's very interesting. A lot of places in California are saying that, essentially, if you are jabbed and you still get the medical condition, right? If you're, you're fully jabbed, you've got however many... Um, doses we're on now. If you get that and you're all current on that and you still get get sick, you can come back to work. Uh, but if you are unjabbed um, and you know you're healthy, you don't have any kind of sickness, um, clean out your desk essentially. So it's one of those things that kind of proves that this has nothing to do with any kind of you know medical science or anything like that. It's really just affecting the the economics as a way to conduct economic warfare and starve out political enemies and stuff like that. So, again, something to keep your eye on because every time I look at something and I say, "Man, that's that's kind of totalitarian," I bet you it'll it'll make its way around the United States pretty soon. So we'll we'll be on the lookout for that. And then moving uh, down to number four, there, uh, Congress uh, actually had a report released. Uh, this was. Um, uh, this has actually also been making its rounds on the kind of alternate news sites, is that a lot of Congress people actually beat the market when it comes to uh, trading. So essentially what people are saying, th- there's, a, a, there's an average for what the market does. And generally speaking, of course, again, not a financial expert whatsoever here, uh, generally speaking, if you do better than what the... Uh, market's average is, um, that looks a little bad. It looks highly suspect. It almost looks like you knew uh, or had some kind of insider trading stuff going on there. And a lot of Congress people were up, were, um, were apparently you know doing that kind of stuff. So a lot of Congress people, both Republicans and Democrats alike, uh, it's very, very much equally split, uh, somehow miraculously made a lot of money when the market was doing very poorly. So, again, this is kind of just like more homework for later, but uh, if you want to check that out, uh, I think it's kind of interesting, but, again, not really a whole lot of intel value there except for, you know, I guess, you know, check out your politician to see where they rank on the list. And then moving down to number five, uh, again, this is one, uh, a a, uh, can of worms that I can't really get into much because it would just take too much time, and that is has been the testimony regarding the FBI and the J6 um, congressional hearings. Uh, really, I think the most interesting part that has come out of that so far, I personally haven't been following that very much because I, I think it's all just political theater. But interestingly enough, the FBI has pleaded the Fifth, uh, the Fifth Amendment. They've invoked their Fifth Amendment rights as an organization regarding their involvement in uh, the J- uh, January 6th, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that's interesting because uh, there, it's just, it seems like how um, it seems like the FBI probably had a larger role than what they're uh, what they're letting on. And I would be very interested to see what comes out of this months down the line. But again, right now, it's all speculation. None of this is really any, has any concrete stuff. So uh, it's really hard to, to say what the FBI did or what they had going on. But I think that we can all kind of, I think it's a, a softball assessment to say, yeah, the FBI was probably planning a lot of this. So very interesting stuff indeed. And continuing on there to number seven, uh, the Biden regime uh, recently, as in the past couple of weeks, has uh, given 
the Taliban government uh, of Afghanistan, uh, $308 million. This is uh, actually brings their total up to $782 million uh, since the fall of uh, Afghanistan. So, again, it's very interesting to see where the, where the Biden regime chooses to spend their money. They're uh, obviously... Uh, saying that it's for humanitarian reasons to prevent mass starvation, but again, as we all know, time and time again, it you know, watch the movie Black Hawk Down, and you know how giving money to a warlord works out. Uh, we've seen a very large uh, contingent of training operations being conducted by the Taliban in Afghanistan. Lots of different military academies that they have set up since the fall of Afghanistan. Uh, lots of special forces units being stood up. The, the Taliban is most certainly. Uh, not just a group of dirt farmers uh, anymore, uh, and they're taking advantage of all of the resources that we left behind uh, and continue to give them in the form of hundreds of millions of dollars. Moving on to number eight there, Massachusetts has uh, launched a digital passport for the you-know-what, um, and I think this is interesting. This one caught my eye because it it states that from, from what I can tell, it looks like most of the digital passport efforts are essentially just a digitization of a, a scan of an actual card, right? An actual, like, paper card. And that's really all it is for the most part. Uh, you see a lot of apps in the App Store for things like that, and it's really just a, a, a website that brings up the PDF that you've scanned in before. However, the Massachusetts one, I need to do some more digging on this because I'm not entirely certain. Uh, it sounds to me like there's a lot of uh, medical provider support for this. As in, uh, uh, there might be, again, don't quote me on this because I'm not quite sure, because all of the, the mainstream news articles I've read on this, which, by the way, is the only sources you can find on this, uh, a lot of these mainstream articles are very vague as to where they're getting the information. Uh, but uh, the reason that it, it kind of brings this up is a lot of people have found that their records aren't showing up. And it's just kind of a sucky app, and it doesn't work that well. Uh, which is no surprise, considering it's a government-built app, right? But the interesting part is that a lot of people are citing that, hey, you know, they should have been able to pull this from my doctor. Like, why is this not working? And that kind of makes somebody like me think, hmm, does this mean that medical providers are cooperating with this and providing HIPAA-protected documents to an app that, you know, people might not know about? I don't know. We'll have to look into it more, but I just wanted to kind of give you the heads up. And then again, number nine there, really no intel value for this. I just thought it was interesting that uh, Nancy Pelosi's son uh, has been uh, tied to a quite large uh, criminal syndicate. Um, you can look into this stuff, just you know, search for Nancy Pelosi's son. You can actually Google it, and actually it comes up in Google, shockingly enough. Uh, but the interesting part about it is that... Uh, it seems like there might be some stuff with Nancy in there, too. I don't know. I don't really care when it comes to politicians, honestly. I just thought it was interesting. So if you guys find it interesting, there you go. All right, so moving quickly through our National Guard slides here in the Northeast region, we have uh, quite a few updates, actually. This is the most significant updates for the country uh, have been for Massachusetts and Maryland. So, uh, again, if you recall, a few months ago or... Yeah, several weeks ago now, Massachusetts actually declared, you know, mission accomplished, right? And they sent everybody home. Well, now they're activating 500 personnel yet again to help with area hospitals for this uh, whatever wave we're on now um, of, of this of this stuff, right? So, again, we're not seeing hospitals being overwhelmed. We're not finding any evidence of that whatsoever, really anywhere in the country, to be honest. But there we go again, 500 personnel in Massachusetts have been activated, at least according to the governor's office. Again, you know, one of the main reasons that we're providing this information is to um, kind of highlight the normalization of uh, deploying significant numbers of troops on U.S. soil uh, for seemingly no reason whatsoever. Um, so again, if you're in Massachusetts, just know that a lot of your hospitals are going to have a lot of service members, you know, working there, doing various tasks and stuff like that. Uh, Maryland is a slightly different story. Um, I need to do a lot more research on this again. Oh, not enough hours in the day, right? Um, but the Maryland uh, deployment ha it seems to be a lot more significant. I don't have numbers at this time, but it seems like it's quite a large deployment. 
Uh, we're also seeing a slight change in the wording of the mission, and I don't know if this is because of Maryland's governor just not um, speaking so eloquently when it comes to the mission uh, during press releases, or if this is something more nefarious. I don't know what the deal is, but it seems like the soldiers that are deployed in the state of Maryland will have a more active role than just helping out at a hospital. It seems like um, you know, we're getting reports of, you know, door-to-door -door efforts. Um, potentially, we're, we're seeing uh, reports of, you know, jab stations being set up and uh, all kinds of uh, medical temporary medical facilities going up again. Uh, I don't really know what the deal is. I guess we'll have to wait and see what, what actually shakes out. But it seems like the, the, the Maryland deployment is a lot more a lot more hands-on. Uh, the governor himself has stated that a lot of National Guard are going to be called upon to physically go out to places like nursing homes and uh, offer medication and things like that. So we'll keep an eye on it. We'll let you know when we have more information. I wish I had more right now, but that's all we've got. Down southeast, really no change whatsoever. Uh, several states have activated their National Guards for various things, but really the numbers are pretty much the same. Same with the Midwest, no change there. And uh, for the southwest, uh, there have been a few incidences with the uh, soldiers in Texas. So again, we're starting to see, if you guys recall, the incidents uh, with Oregon um, with a lot of National Guard uh, service members and senior military claiming that the... Um, the, the political leadership of Oregon was simply deploying the National Guard just as a, a political means. And we're starting to see inklings of that right now. Um, actually, that's putting it lightly. We're seeing a lot. Uh, we're seeing a lot of complaints from um, very junior soldiers as well as commanders. Um, uh, we're seeing a lot of, of people complaining that this is just kind of a BS mission at this point, that uh, Greg Abbott is uh, keeping people down at the border in very squalid and hor horrifying conditions uh, just to uh, serve as like a political, you know, finger, right, to the Biden uh, regime. So I guess we'll have to see how this works out, but we're getting report after report after report uh, from soldiers down there stating that they're basically living in uh, worse than incarceration conditions. Um, and we've seen a lot of photos, and it's, yeah, it looks it looks pretty bad. So, you know, again, Greg Abbott's own numbers state that we're talking roughly 10,000 uh, Army National Guard slash State Guard slash uh, Department of Public Safety guys in this theater of operations for Operation Lone Star. And um, it looks like this is doing a lot more harm than good, uh, especially when we start starting to see more incidences uh, between the soldiers and the civilian populace or the cartel down there. This is just, uh, uh, we're starting to see a lot more uh, incidents regarding that. And then moving out west, uh, speaking of Oregon, uh, like I mentioned, Oregon has a history of um, their political leadership abusing the uh, Army National Guard and Air National Guard assets of the state. Uh, for political reasons, or at least so the service members have been complaining. Well, apparently they haven't learned their lesson because there is a new push in Oregon to deploy uh, soldiers yet again uh, to uh, state area hospitals. So this actually occurred over the you know past couple of weeks uh, between the last brief and now. Uh, we have in Oregon over 1,200 soldiers and airmen uh, deployed around the state to various hospitals and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I, I guess we'll have to see if, if they're treated any better this time. Um, but yeah, it certainly seems like it's, it's more political than not. So again, that's our National Guard outlook, or rather wrap-up for this brief. Moving on to the K-12 through public school slides. Uh, there is one update that, that I haven't changed on the slide yet, but I wanted to speak to, and that is Virginia. So for those of you who don't know, Virginia got a new governor. And on the very first day has signed a lot of executive orders, banning mask mandates, uh, launching inve uh, the new attorney general uh, there in Virginia is launching a lot of investigations regarding the mistreatment of, of, thing, uh, of children and things like that. So I haven't actually looked at what has been done, so I didn't want to change the slide just yet. Uh, so I don't know if how this is going to work out because as as we know right this slide is misleading in in and of itself because 
a lot of states don't have legislation that either bans or mandates masks being worn in public schools, but schools do. Like, for instance, Texas is kind of one of those states where, for a time period there, remember a couple months ago, Texas had a, a, a ban on mask mandates, and yet, like, 90% of all the school districts in Texas were mandating masks. So it's like, what, what what's going on here? Um, you know, South Carolina is still kind of in that situation, and Virginia might be in that situation now. So we've got to drill down and, and do more uh, work to figure out what's going on in Virginia there. Um, likewise, with the uh, the actual jab mandates, no real change there. We're starting to see a lot more resistance in California, as one might expect. So um, that state might actually be turning. A uh, different color here very soon, but I guess we'll have to see. And then finally, for the kind of overall resistance tracker sort of thing that we've got going on here, is uh, the only thing I changed is Virginia. I changed that to green just because of, again, all of the uh, efforts that have been undertaken by the recent state political leadership of Virginia to reverse a lot of the stuff that the previous um, administration did. So uh, this might be all a farce. I don't know. We'll see, have to see how this stuff works out in the end. But right now, um, you know, the commander in chief of the Virginia National Guard is uh, is doing um, some pretty decent stuff to reverse a lot of this stuff. Now, again, we'll have to see how this works out. But as far as on paper goes, it seems like Virginia is moving in the right direction. Then moving on to mandate failures. Uh, I haven't actually changed this slide, but there is one update that I forgot to add to it, and that is General Electric. So this is a big one. General Electric has... Um, in the wake of the uh, Supreme Court's uh, decision to uh, go against Biden's mandates, uh, General Electric has come, come out and said, yeah, we're not going to uh, mandate this stuff anymore. And this is interesting. You can kind of see which companies you know, basically had the metaphorical gun to their head when it came to the mandates because General Electric clearly had a workforce that was very resistant to it. You know, General Electric is one of the largest... Um, employers in the country and so as one might expect you know in, in the field of General Electric they're not going to be super uh, happy about you know medical mandates and stuff but General Electric being a federal contractor and having again a very good chunk of their uh, profits coming from the federal government they're you know in a you know between a rock and a hard place and of course you know they chose the side of the government which is telling enough but I also think it's interesting that as soon as the Supreme Court came out and said anything against the Biden regime, General Electric ran away from the federal government as fast as possible, at least when it comes to these mandates. You can see some other companies, too, and see what they want to do. The companies that went out and instantly dropped their mandates due to the Supreme Court's uh, decision, those are interesting to look into a little bit more. And uh, I also think that the companies that uh, haven't issued a statement or they haven't changed or they've doubled down on their mandates since the Supreme Court uh, came out with their decision, that's, um, that's also telling as well. And moving into international issues, I really only have just a handful of stuff because, like I, like I mentioned in the past few weeks, have just been filled with Ukraine stuff. Um, but uh, one of the bigger ones is Scotland. So Scotland has... Um, been revoking medical treatment for uh, expectant mothers if they are not uh, jabbed, and that has been uh, something that has been rolling through uh, the news uh, outlets in the UK for a while now. Um, Going to be very interested to see how that works out because it seems like it seems like the United Kingdom is kind of backing down. Uh, from their stuff, uh, you know, old Boris, <laughs> uh, he's he's gotten himself into a lot of trouble lately. Uh, with what with um, being uh, confirmed to be at parties and hosting parties right when uh, he was, you know, giving testimony before Parliament uh, regarding how dangerous and bad and you know winter of severe death and illness or or whatever <laughs> whatever he's been saying to the British population. Uh, so, yeah, he he's uh, really having a hard time uh, maintaining a a sort of straight face when it comes to all this stuff because it, it's really kind of obvious that it's just about totalitarianism at this point. So we'll see how long this lasts. Um, the UK has, has had some ha a lot of resistance lately. So again, um, we'll see how Scotland is able to uh, pull that one out. 
Uh, and then moving on, speaking of uh, medical resistance, Italy has also been very, very vocal. At least the, the Italian people have been very, very vocal and uh, physical regarding their resistance to medical mandates, uh, as have been a lot of places around Europe. So, again, we're seeing some places double down, like France has doubled down with, with their medical tyranny, but other countries um, have have been quietly like backing off because they, they see the power of the people, I guess. But... Um, and then jumping back to Europe for a second, uh, like I mentioned, totalitarianism, huge, huge thing in Europe these days, uh, specifically in Germany and Austria, which have become really the poster child for how to uh, violently crack down and hurt as many civilians as you possibly can if you're a government force. Uh, so the German police and the Austrian police have been observed to commit many, many crimes against their people, uh, at least from what we can see, um, just to, you know, force their tyranny on, on people and uh, people are uh, people are not happy about that now as someone who has um, uh, spent some time in Germany uh, I've studied Germany quite a lot I speak German it's uh, not surprising whatsoever to see the stuff that is happening uh, in Germany right now their, their history um, even though from an American perspective we like to make jokes about it right uh, it, it's really it's really a cultural thing at this point, I think, and um, it's going to be very interesting to see what kind of resistance efforts come out of Germany uh, and Austria as well. Uh, two countries which honestly are very, very different when it comes to the uh, cultures of them, but their governments, uh, as of late, have been very, very similar uh, in the totalitarianism regard. But again, uh, interesting, interesting stuff to look up. And then finally, North Korea. Our, uh, our fun little buddy out of uh, the northern peninsula there has uh, been uh, up to no good with uh, launching lots and lots of projectiles into the Sea of Japan um, as of late. So, again, I, I think that North Korea is kind of a, a an international case study in just weird stuff, right? I don't think that you can look at North Korea and, and think that that's any kind of doctrine. It, it's very it's a very special case study. Uh, so when North Korea launches missiles and things like that, everybody looks and goes, oh my god, you know, North Korea is, you know, you know, whatever. Well, you know, North Korea is kind of a case study, honestly. Their, their, their population is starving to death. Their political leadership is like the most comical Bond villains you could possibly imagine. And their technological capabilities, while impressive in the regard that they can take old Soviet equipment and duplicate it, is not really something I would consider a major threat. Um, now, that being said, someone clearly thinks uh, otherwise in the FAA because a couple weeks ago there was a, a, a national, or I should say it wasn't a national, it was just for the West Coast, a ground stop from the FAA. Uh, which was confusing for a lot of people. And again, I should point out this is very speculative uh, because right at the time of a North Korean missile launch uh, is when the national ground stop was initiated. And a lot of people have been kind of confused by this. Um, they were de Everyone was confused at the time, listening to police scanners of local areas and, and airports trying to figure out what's going on, why did the FAA issue a ground stop? Has there been some kind of attack or something like that? Uh, and nobody could figure it out. Well, a few hours later, we find out North Korea had launched a missile right during that kind of time frame. So I don't know if this was some kind of emergency U.S. military response that we they kind of let the cat out of the bag on or uh, because they thought that maybe based on the trajectory of the missile that it might come close to the U.S. I don't know. North Korea is going to be very hard-pressed to get a missile that far, and even then we're going to have so much warning, it's it's crazy. Um, so I don't really consider North Korea a direct threat to the United States, and most analysts would agree. It's you know North Korea is definitely a threat to places like Japan, but you know as far as a North Korean nuke landing in my backyard, I'm not exactly holding my breath on that one. But it's interesting to see the U.S. response nonetheless, if that in fact was the response. And finally, before I ended, I wanted to talk about Russia and Ukraine for a bit because uh, that has really been on my brain for the past few months now, and especially I haven't been able, I haven't really been thinking about much else other than Ukraine uh, lately, as of the past couple of weeks. And that's because we've seen a lot of very scary stuff happen. Um, uh, let me put it to you this way. As an analyst, you try to, you go through and a lot of times try to think of 
well, what would World War III look like? Or what would something, what would a gl mass global conflict look like? What would be the early indications and warnings of such, such an event? Like, what would be the worst case scenario of stuff like that? And, um... Uh, every analyst does this regardless of whether or not they want to admit it or not. Everybody has a, an end-of-the-world plan or thinks about it at least because that's just kind of the you know nature of the job, I guess. But for me uh, and for the rest of the team here, we've seen some really scary stuff. And I'm going to start off with the biggest one, which is the Norwegian communications cable being cut. Um, let me just say this is a, this is a big freaking deal. Uh, so for those of you that don't understand... Um, most of the communications on planet Earth, uh, if you're wanting to get, we're talking the internet, um, military communications, uh, every, basically every byte of information that, that is, um, transits around the world has to go through communications cables, right? Maybe not so much in the United States. Like, you can probably send an email from California, from a computer in California to a computer in New York, and it never transit on a submarine cable. A submarine cable meaning it, it's a cable that's underwater, like an undersea cable. Um, but for the most part, uh, these communications cables are the lifeblood of the human race, essentially. Uh, if you want information, it's going to come from an underwater cable. Usually only just a few cables, honestly. So, for instance, the United Kingdom is kind of freaking out right now because they're an island nation. And they've only got a few cables going from the United Kingdom across the, the English Channel into Europe. And just a few days ago, or I think a couple weeks ago now, Norway revealed that one of their submarine cables, one of their undersea cables between uh, the mainland and the Svalbard archipelago, which housed a satellite uh, communication station, had been cut. Um, and that it, it, and that not only had it been cut, but it was like obviously cut in such a way that it, it was obviously a, a man-made thing. The ends of the cable were were, were many many meters apart. Um, it was most certainly not a um, a geologic event uh, because again, uh, cables on the lay, literally laying on the seafloor, um, they're heavily armored. They're usually got you know many many inches of steel armor wrapped around them, because geologic events occur. Underwater earthquakes and underwater like landslides and things like that can cut cables pretty easily, and that happens fairly often. Um, it happened uh, a few years ago. It was a pretty big incident with the United States, if I recall. I had one of our cables cut that way, and it was it was totally a natural event. Um, but this one was is definitely a uh, is definitely a man-made thing. So so the Norwegians say, and the reason for bringing this up is that Russia over the since the Cold War, since the end of the Cold War, has pumped trillions and trillions of dollars into their undersea they call it oceanographic research. Uh, branch of their navy. So um, we all know how the U.S. Navy works, right? Or roughly speaking, we have U.S. Navy sailors on uh, U.S. Navy ships, and we sometimes have, you know, merchant marines on uh, naval ships, and we have naval support ships like like hospital ships and oilers and things like that. Well, the Russians have an entire directorate that's basically like a naval version of the CIA. And their sole goal is to do secret squirrel stuff on the seafloor. Now, we can get into this a lot further. Um, recently, uh, this has been a very hard topic to talk about. Or, or actually, sorry, in the past, this has been a very hard topic to talk about. Only recently has this been talked about openly before. But, again, this is very much a, a topic for another time. The larger point here is that I personally can't think of any time when the Russians would have actually cut a cable. They've tapped a few cables, they've tried to tap a few cables um, to tap into them, literally like sending little mini submarines down with little arms on them that grab these cables and drill into them to kind of collect intelligence from them. Uh, they've done that before, but I've, uh, and they've practiced cutting cables uh, because the reason this is all important is that one of the main kind of triggers for World War III, or a very global conflict, with Russia being a major belligerent of that conflict, is for Russia to cut undersea cables. Essentially, 
That's how you're going to know that World War III has started when the internet just dies. You have no communications whatsoever because, you know, 30 or 40 different undersea cables are all cut all at once. That's kind of, you know, worst case World War III scenario. Um, and one of these cables has been cut um, very deliberately. And this is something that is, I'm sure this woke up a lot of dudes in the middle of the night and put them on planes because this is, again, I cannot state how, how big of a deal this is. Uh, now, as far as any other cables, uh, I'm sure that other countries' navies are inspecting uh, their cables at the moment. But again, this takes months to do. And this, honestly, since it was so deliberate, this might have been one of those warnings, like, you know, again, to the Western world, hey, don't mess with us in Ukraine or else we're going to cut, you know, all of your cables next time. Because if you remember, Russia doesn't need communications cables. They're the largest country on Earth. They, you know, have land-based systems, whereas Europe is very much, you know, has a lot of maritime space that, that it occupies. Um, and that kind of ties into what I was mentioning earlier about the United States, uh, the, the vulnerabilities to the United States, is, is that, like, hey, if Russia cut this cable, let's just say they're the ones who did it, and if they did it to serve as a warning to Europe to stay out of its way with Ukraine, then... You know, I, I can't imagine them not doing some kind of cyber stuff here in the United States. So, again, that's why all of this stuff is kind of important to keep an eye on. Not just because this, you know, might spin out of control, uh, but also because we have direct impacts to the United States as well. Also, briefly wanted to mention Kazakhstan. Uh, Kazakhstan, that, that by the time that we had gotten slides together to talk about it, it was already over. Essentially, there was a coup that occurred in Kazakhstan to kind of overthrow their dictator government. Uh, and that coup was put down conveniently because Russia uh, sent a lot of airborne troops in uh, at the request of the Kazakhstan government to kind of help put that down. And this matters for the airborne operations in Ukraine because now... Those soldiers are currently free to uh, invade Ukraine or provide support for that. And then finally with Ukraine, uh, again, I'm going to have a separate brief on this. Uh, but uh, the one thing that I did want to touch on is the possibility of a false flag attack. Now, this is an important thing to note that uh, I've been looking at a lot of Russian media and uh, Russian sources along with American sources. And... They both say the same thing. Both sides, both the Western world and Russia, have, have accused each other of planning false flag attacks to justify uh, some kind of incursion, <laughs> a polite word for invasion, uh, over the next 24, 48 hours. Now, as far as the United States planning a false flag attack to justify the United States backing up Ukraine, I think that's kind of a laughable concept. The United States has done everything they possibly can to openly state that we're not going to support Ukraine. Uh, that is very much something that we have done. I think that it's laughable for us to assume that we're going to do anything more than send some, some special forces, maybe some equipment, maybe. Um, but even then, the United Kingdom is having to pick up the slack and send a, a lot of uh, ATGMs to Ukraine right now. So, again, the United States is very much not interested in defending or helping defend Ukraine, which, for whatever reason, you know, you can ar you can make arguments of, of like, hey, we have this historical agreement that uh, we, you know, said, hey, we, we bought all of Ukraine's or, or forced Ukraine to de-arm at the... Um, uh, with the agreement in mind that we would come to Ukraine's aid uh, militarily uh, should they should Russia get squirrely. And, you know, the time has come. Uh, Ukraine did their part. They disarmed themselves, which I'm sure they're regretting now. And the United States has not held up our end of the bargain. But, again, I guess we can debate that another day. When it comes to the actual false flag attacks reasoning, uh, I think Russia has far more motive. Obviously, they have more motive to... Uh, conduct a false flag attack uh, to justify their incursion slash invasion into the rest of Ukraine. Because as we remember, uh, the question is not, is Russia going to invade Ukraine? Because Russia has already invaded Ukraine. 8% of the Ukrainian landmass is now part of the Russian Federation. Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014, and that's just been the way it is since then. The question is, how much are they going to invade this time? Are they going to launch another push to take even more of Ukraine? A lot of people are saying that these false flag attacks on both sides of the aisle 
are going to be kind of the go no go criteria for uh, th this invasion. Meaning that if Russia can't pull off this uh, this false flag attack, they're going to wait until next year because the spring thaw is going to make it very difficult to maneuver in the uh, Ukrainian uh, countryside uh, once once everything starts getting muddy again, and that would give Ukraine the advantage. Um, I think, uh, me personally, I don't think that, I think that was a valid argument a while back. I don't think so now, because I think that Russia has has stacked up. They've invested too much, uh, too many resources now uh, for them to for them to back down. So I guess we'll have to see how it shakes out, though. But another thing that I wanted to mention is the NotPetya uh, cyber attack. Now this was a cyber attack that got zero uh, coverage in the U.S. press, but got a lot in the European press because of the uh, Petya cyber attacks from before. So this is again a Russian-based cyber cyber group uh, launched a series of devastating cyber attacks on critical infrastructure in Ukraine over the past couple of days. Now these attacks are very interesting because unlike the Petya cyber attacks, these are not or, or they were not intended to be ransomware. They were intended to look like ransomware. Uh, so that a person would think, oh, okay, they're just trying to steal money from us. While at the same time, um, the, the cyber attack was actually destroying stuff. So this is one of those hard wartime-like cyber attacks, like our full you know, cyber warfare stuff of destroying systems with no intention of getting money out of it whatsoever. Um, so that's interesting, and yet, yet another indicator uh, that Russia, they mean business this time. So again, like I mentioned, we're going to have a whole separate thing on Ukraine here in just a bit. Um, for those of you who, who want to follow that conflict, um, yeah, like I mentioned to the, to the folks on Patreon earlier, uh, we're kind of treating this like an Afghanistan 2.0 with regards to the fact that there are Americans in Ukraine that um, uh, probably would want to get out of Ukraine if it were to be invaded by an invading force which is notorious for taking no prisoners. Um, so again, if you think Afghanistan was bad, man, just, just wait, um, because the Ukrainian conflict has been, um, very bad so far and, um, we're just getting started. So again, as to the grand question that everyone's asking, will Russia do it? I don't know. Nobody knows. Anybody who tries to tell you they know is, is lying to you or they're just guessing. All right now it's at a 50-50 shot, but I would I would argue that, um, or I would rather say that we're spending a lot of time making maps, downloading imagery, putting together products, uh, stuff like that, because it's uh, it's looking like it's an impossible... Uh, impossible action for Russia to uh, step down at this point from this. So it looks like it's it's not an if but when. Um, and we you know again we might be fools and we might uh, all look at this differently. But hey, it's better to prepare and have wasted a little effort making a map than it would be to uh, uh, to watch this on CNN. So we'll keep moving forward and we'll uh, catch you on the next brief. Um, thank you again to everyone who has supported us. It really helps keep the lights on here. Uh, with regards to what we're able to do and capabilities wise and stuff like that. So thank you again for all of your support. And here are your sources for this time. Uh, slide one, slide two, slide three, four, and five. So again, thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for the uh, upcoming brief. The next one will be uh, a, a sort of uh, introduction to the Ukrainian conflict. So thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you next time.